traditional farmers are targeted for extinction. They will be extinct by the end of this decade if, mm. if it continues on this trajectory. And we have to stop that because the, there's not many things humans need to do, but one of them is to eat healthy food if you want to stay alive. You're not, we're not going to survive on synthetic garbage that they're creating for us. It's not going to work. It's not going to end well at all. So when you're farm, the, this is the reason, the point I'm going back to is that when you're outside farming, you get sun exposure. Imagine that you're not inside looking at social media, on your computer, watching TV or whatever. You're not indoors. You need to be outside for a significant amount of the day. So most of us aren't there. We're not farmers. We have jobs. We have responsibilities. So what can you do? Practical limit, practical thing you can do is understand that there is a time value of the exposure. So you're not, you, it's great to be outside any time of the day, even at night, but the value biolog from the biological radiation, radiation from the sun peaks at solar noon. Now, right now we're not in daylight savings time. So solar noon is solar noon, 12 o'clock. And when daylight saving times kicks in, typically after April 1st, uh, then we go forward. So solar noon is one o'clock. So to be outside with minimal clothing around solar noon for about an hour is a good goal. Hey everyone, Dr. Josh Axe here and welcome to the Ancient Health Podcast. Today we are going to be talking to an old friend of mine, somebody I've known for so many years. In fact, I attended one of his wellness seminars. This would have been back in 2004, so 20 years ago. It's Dr. Jo uh, Joseph Mercola and uh, super excited to have him today. We're going to be talking about the link between emotional well-being and our physical health. We'll dive into Dr. Mercola's latest books and his fresh insights on health topics. And there's always something new uh, that I learn every time I talk to Dr. Mercola. And we're also going to be catching up on his recent endeavors and how he believes we can better integrate mental and physical health into mm -hmm. our daily routines for improved health and well-being. And so, so excited to dive in here together. Uh, Dr. Mercola, thanks uh, so much for coming on and welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. Well, hey, I want to dive right in because there are so many questions I have for you. We maybe go 10, 12 rounds here. Yeah, One of the sure. first, though, is let's talk about the mental health today of the country. One of the things that I know you and I have noticed, I remember 20 years ago when I attended your first seminar, you talked a lot about insulin and uh, mm -hmm. insulin resistance and the issues today regarding diabetes being on the climb, maybe faster than any disease when you looked at childhood diabetes and obesity. Well, today, when you look at the statistics, mental health issues over the past five years have skyrocketed. What do you believe some of the root causes are of mental health issues increasing so significantly? Well, I think there's many variables that contribute to it, but one of the ones that I'm passionate about is exploring the biological variables that contribute to that. And that's what I really spent the last 50 years exploring. So there's a real strong connection between your body's ability to create uh, cellular energy, usually from the mitochondria, not always, but typically. And once that energy, cellular energy production decreases, you have less overall energy. Now your brain is obviously where the mental health issues, right? It's in your brain. So it's 2% of your body, yet, but yet consumes 20% of the energy your body produces, 20%. That's an extraordinary fact. So it, it strongly suggests that, the, that energy is important for the brain and for mental health. So <clears throat> in 2004, I'd, I haven't done really my own presentations that or at least I've sponsored my own for about 20 years, two decades. It's a long time. I, I've spoken, I speak pretty much every year at someone's, but not mine. Uh, that might change in the future. Uh, it likely will, but right for now, I haven't been. So, but when I was doing it back then, my understanding was insulin. And what I've come to appreciate since that time is that insulin is for the most part an innocent bystander. It's not the cause it, it, in any way, shape or form. It form. Yes, it is probably the single best biometric indicator of metabolic flexibility. And 95%, Josh, 95% of people in the United States are metabolically inflexible. Actually, the number was 93.4%, and that was done in a 2019 NHANES data. So it's five years old. So it's probably over maybe 96% of the U.S. because it's gone up linearly, straight up. So what's the cause? The cause is not too much carbs, not too much sugar, but it is probably related to too much processed foods because what's in processed foods universally and is not appreciated. Very few people understand this is, is a 
product of industrialization that occurred in the late, that started in the late, or the, the American Civil War, 1870s, where they attained the ability to extract oil from seeds, seed oils, or mm. vegetable oils, what they're euphemistically called today, inaccurately, euphemistically. They're, they're seed oils. And never before in human history that you w it was impossible to eat a seed oil prior to 1870 now we eat them and in fact it's the primary fat that most people consume and there's a consequence for that because these are really fragile perishable fats that are highly susceptible to oxidative stress and th the fats themselves aren't particularly dangerous but because they're so susceptible to being damaged they form these really toxic metabolic byproducts they're called oxlams, which is oxidative linoleic acid metabolites, and they call other things too, but that's probably the most accurate. And there are many dangerous ones to some of people for like 4-hydroxynonol, 4-HNE, uh, malandialdehyde. Uh, there are literally hundreds of these reactive aldehydes that cause all the damage. And if you don't have high linoleic acid, you can't make them. That's, so the solution isn't to, and it's nice mm. to have antioxidants to protect you and stuff, but it would be better, you know, that I believe, and I'm sure you do too, that prevention is the key. So that, in my mind, is the most important change that's occurred that contributes to this. And yes, they're stressors. Yes, they brainwashed and propagandized us during the COVID and people are dying needlessly and dropping like flies as a result of their suggestions and interventions and mandates and coercion. But fundamentally, those who are healthier biologically and, and are able to create cellular energy have good thyroid function and, and really their brain works. They can have critical thinking skills and they can function the way they were designed to. So I think that's the answer to your question. Yeah, I, I think these are excellent points. And I think that one of the other thing, as you mentioned, I think culture in general, you know, social media, you know, right? People being addicted to their smartphones. No. You know, you know that, that there's issues there as well, right? Affecting the younger people, mental health and well-being. I know one of the things that people are trading is spending time on their devices, whether it be a cell phone or a computer or a tablet. Instead of spending time outside, you were one of the first people I heard talking about the benefits of sunlight and vitamin D. Could you discuss a little bit more specifically sunlight yeah. because it's more than just vitamin d right and to get oh, into vitamin it d is. But how very, does it impact us that was a very prescient question thank you for asking it because you know I, i've i'm writing a new book and it'll be out in the fall it's actually written but we're staging a, a whole variety of functions or activities around it so so i know what the book is and i've condensed 50 years of studying and really uh, seeking to understand biology and what optimizes it and, and summarize it to five points. And the very first one is what you said. I think the most foundational thing that you can do to stay healthy is to be in the sun. That's number one. And certainly for some of the reason is to optimize vitamin D. Now, please understand that means a, a variety of things. You, first of all, you have to live in a location where that's possible. Most of us don't. I happen to live in Florida, so it is possible most of the year, although there's two to three months. Fortunately, we just escaped them as we're recording this. It's mid-March and it, I'm getting plenty. You know, we have we only literally have about um, maybe two months of the year where, we're, where there's not sufficient sunshine. Not uh, well because of the latitude, the the, the rays. You're not going to get sufficient ultraviolet B, and the more important, which is near infrared. So the first thing is you have to live in the right latitude uh, to get the sun exposure. But even if you do, say you're living on the equator, if you're living in, in indoors all the time and not going outside, exposing your sun or skin to the sun, you're not going to benefit from that latitude. You have to be in the sun. You know, at the turn of the, 19th, or the 20th century, do you know what the most common occupation was in America? Probably farming. Farming is correct. That is yeah. correct. You got it. it it's my hope. I fully, and why am I going there? Well, for two reasons. One is that AI is upon us. Everyone knows that. And most likely will result in the loss of maybe a quarter of the jobs that exist right now. Mm. I think that's highly yeah. likely. So you're going to wonder, what are these people going to do? Hmm. What could they possibly do? Well, you know, we have industrial agriculture, which is an abomination, absolute abomination, and yep. certainly largely responsible for much of the disease, primarily because almost all of industrial ag agriculture uses these processed seed oils. That's what they do. That's what they make them. That's, a, you know, corn, soy, canola. <laughs> these are all bad. Yeah. News. These are not good news items for us. And yet that's a huge portion of what industrial agriculture is producing ostensibly as food.
So what they can, what two points, one, I'm getting back to the original. It is a tangent. I'm, I'm, I know where I'm going. <laughs> just, just, just to assure you the, um, what the people who are displaced by AI can do is be, return to farming and really serve as a substitute. Because one of my goals is to destroy industrial agriculture. And I think, that, and I'm grateful for AI to facilitate that transition back to the, to the earth. And when they're, and, and when they're farming conventionally, because they, traditional farmers are targeted for extinction, they will be extinct by the end of this decade if, mm. if it continues on this trajectory. And we have to stop that because there's not many things humans need to do, but one of them is to eat healthy food. If you want to stay alive, you're not, we're not going to survive on synthetic garbage that they're creating for us. It's not going to work. It's not going to end well at all. So when you're farm, this is the reason, the point I'm going back to is that when you're outside farming, you get sun exposure. Imagine that you're not inside looking at social media on your computer, watching TV or whatever. You're not indoors. You need to be outside for a significant part of the day. So. Most of us aren't there. We're not farmers. We have jobs. We have responsibilities. So what can you do? The practical limit, practical thing you can do is understand that there is a time value of the exposure. So you're not, you, it's great to be outside any time of the day, even at night, but the value by a lot from the biological radiation, radiation from the sun peaks at solar noon. Now, right now we're not in daylight savings time. So solar noon is solar noon, 12 o'clock. And when daily saving times kicks in, typically after April 1st, uh, then we go forward. So solar noon is one o'clock. So to be outside with minimal clothing around solar noon for about an hour is a good goal. And maybe if you're in really low latitude, single digit latitudes, maybe it's 15, 20 minutes because you're, you're good, especially in the, in the summer months. So you'll need less, but, but the key is to get outside and you, you properly suggested that there was more than vitamin D. It is. The 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 primary issue, uh, the, the other variable that's that virtually very few people appreciate is near infrared radiation, near IR, which composes about 15 to 20 percent of the solar radiation or solar solar, I think it's solar radiation. Yeah. So the UVB, which creates vitamin D, is about five percent. So it's like four or five times higher then the wavelengths are responsible for creating vitamin D. So you would think, yeah, but it's that much higher. Maybe there's some importance to it. And there probably is. And that's, it'd be correct. Um, and so the question becomes, what does it do? Have you thought about what it does or do you have any idea? Oh yeah. You're, you're, well, you're asking vitamin D or just sunshine in no, general? No, sun, no, the near infrared radiation. Yeah, well, I know one of the things it does is it's incredible for the health of our mitochondria. I mean, our cellular yes. energy. Our cell yeah. yeah, yeah, that is the answer. That is the correct answer. Gold star for for Josh. <laughs> That's <is> correct, <laughs> and, and it, it is absolutely essential for mitochondrial cellular energy production. But the, the more accurate question is, how does it do it? How does it? How does it cause it? The, what's the mechanism? How does it produce energy? How does it facilitate energy, energy production in the mitochondria? Yeah, well, again, well, I know, I know probably a little bit more about how it does it in the liver, but I'll let you explain it from the cellular standpoint. Okay. Well, well, it's actually subcellular in mitochondria. The, um, there's mechanisms and none of these mechanisms are proven. I, I, my intention is to prove the latter, which is probably responsible for 75% of the, the production. And that is. When the, when the lights come down, they hit your tissues and near infrared has, is not obstructed by water. It's not absorbed by water for far and mid is. And as a result of that, because your body's consisted of a lot of water, it's bulk water typically. Uh, I forget the percentages. I should know that, but I don't recall what the percentage, but it's a significant percentage of your body, water molecules. And when there's water molecules in your tissue, the, the near and far runs do not penetrate. They only go down like a, 16th of an inch, maybe a 32nd, very, just su very superficial, top part of your skin. They do not penetrate your organs. The only thing that penetrates your organs is near infrared. So you think there's some secret sauce in there? There is. When, because they're not hitting the water mouth. So what do they hit? Well, one theory, and it probably is responsible for 25% of the improvement, is it hits the complexes in the mitochondria. There's, there's five of them. And the fourth one is the most important case, an enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. Mm -hmm. And that enzyme contains metals, uh, sometimes viewed as uh, minerals, uh, such as iron and copper. Uh, but they're metals. They're, they're actually chemical metals. And they function as chromophores. 
which means it's a fancy Latin word for it attracts light. It's, you know, it's like a magnet for light. So it goes there. And what does it do once it hits complex four? Uh, typically as a result of metabolic inflexibility and biological impairment, there, there's an increase in nitric oxide. And most of us think nitric oxide is useful, but in, in, when it's high, it is not. It's actually pernicious and can cause lots of damage. So with the, what the belief is, and it's probably likely true because there's a lot of su anecdotal support around it, is that the near infrared light actually displaces. It's not a covalent bond. It's it's actually ionic, but it displaces. It's, it's the energy provided displaces nitric oxide, and then and then complex four can generate energy more efficiently. And then essentially, because the next place is complex five, and that's ATP synthase, and you're generating uh, ATP. So that's twenty five percent. The other seventy five percent is likely related to the fact that it creates structured water. And uh, in structured, do you know what structured water is? You've yeah, heard of, of it, course. Right? Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, a lot of people drink it, but that's not the ideal way to do it. I mean, it's okay. I mean, it's not going to hurt you, but it's not going to give the bad the benefit that you need. And what what does structured water? It's a, it's also called hexagonal water or gel water. It has actually has a different molecular structure. It's not H two O. It's H three O two. And if you look at it molecularly, it's like a beehive. It's got these mm. hexagons, and also, and it's and it, what it does is it stores it stores the energy, actually creates a differential electrical potential, so that you have a negative and a positive, and that's like a battery. It serves as a functional battery. So, what happens is there's there's items in your cells, and I'm not going to disclose it because I've actually in the process of writing a paper, and uh, I'm. Pretty confident it's going to be candidate for a Nobel Prize because this is a mechanism that has to do with how that occurs. I've discovered it. No one else has. I figured it out. But it's responsible for about 75% of the benefit of infrared light into the body. But essentially what it does functionally without disclosing the mechanism, it can, it's a transducer. It converts the sunlight to stored energy in a battery, which then is transferred to the mitochondria, mitochondria and that Energy also incre increases the hydrogen ion concentration in the intermitochondrial space, which which is what's needed to drive ATP synthase. So it facilitates uh, production of, mito of cellular mitochondrial energy, very similar to the way glucose is a storage. When you eat enough glucose, your body doesn't use it. What does it do with it? I mean, if it's a lot, it can store it as fat, but that's kind of wasteful. What it wants to do first is use it for immediate uh, use and that would be going to your liver and storing it as glycogen so that when you're not eating you're sleeping that your liver has a supply of glucose because that brain again that energy right if you don't have glucose you're dead you are literally dead in seconds you know i don't care how much you're fasting or how much ketones you're making or, or ingesting as a supplement exogenously you'll be dead you, you you're you're, you're Yes, ketones supply energy to the brain. They're, they're a cofactor, but they are not the sole source. If you don't have sugar molecules in your brain, you are yep. dead. <laughs> There's no way around. And to prove it, give anyone a dose of insulin and they'll die because it drops the sugar levels too, too high or too low and you're dead. You go into a hypoglycemic coma and your brain stops working. That's not a good thing. That's why we have these, they're called stress hormone responses like glucagon, adrenaline, and uh, cortisol that catalyze the formation of glucose. So, so if someone's foolishly fast for a week, which I don't think is a good idea for most people, I used to think it was good, but now I know it's not because I've uh, learned from Dr. Ray Pete's work who passed last year or the year before last, um, that that's not a good idea because stress hormones are real and they keep you alive. But you know, when you're chronically activating your stress hormones and producing the emotional stressors, which was your first question, then it could be, a, uh, problematic. So actually fasting could contribute to those emotional stressors. You know, it's not the, necessarily the best thing for you. And I would be very cautious about recommending fasting. I don't know if you're still involved in keto or low carb or intermittent fasting. No, but. no. You know what? I, I've never just, uh, I've never recommended keto for long-term use. Yeah, I've that's, never. That's good. It's smart. Yeah. Yeah. Because of that very same thing. Yeah. 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 It's just stress hormones to do it. You know, because you're, it all boils down to the brain needing sugar. There's no way around it. And if you're not ingesting it, as you should, because most people need, I would say, a minimum of 150 grams of sugar a day, glucose, sugar. Uh, yeah. And the best form is, what would you say the best form of sugar is, if you're to get that? What's the? Well, I'm a huge blueberry fan. 
but okay. you know, it, yeah, that, well, that's the right answer. Name, not necessarily blueberries, but blueberries is sort of a, a care because there's a lot of good polyphenols. And if you have a healthy gut, those polyphenols are actually very beneficial to improve gut health. But if you don't have a healthy gut, as most people don't, they don't have a then True. blueberries can be problematic, highly yeah. problematic because there's fibers in there and the fibers are digested. When you have an unhealthy gut, you have a predominance of pathogenic bacteria, gram negative uh, facultative anaerobes that embedded in their cell walls uh, is endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide LPS. And when they are fed and fertilized and grow and die, the, that endotoxin is a potent metabolic poison, it just suppresses mitochondrial function and in large doses can kill you from septic shock. And that does happen to many people every year because they die of endotoxin toxicity because they're because of gut microbiome imbalance. So that's a paradox because some fruits can be dangerous if you yeah. if you have an unhealthy gut. So it all depends. It all depends. But your fruit, I believe, is the healthiest carbohydrate you could possibly eat. And I eat like four pounds of watermelon in the morning, and uh, and I have oranges and apples throughout the day. So I'm a big fan of fruit. And I think most people take it, need 150 grams going to 50 car, gram low carb is, you know, prescription for disaster in my viewpoint. And many people believe that and, and, and follow that, but I would encourage them to reconsider and follow some of Ray Pete's work uh, about the stress hormones. But, uh, you know, I think most people benefit from hires. I'm personally floating around 400, 450 grams of carbohydrates a day. So I feel really good with it. And I, you know, my, I guess what my, I measure my insulin like every two weeks or so. Guess what it was last time? You won't believe it. It was unmeasurable. Nine. It was less than 0 0.4. Wow. Now, that's pretty exceptional with 450 grams of carbs a day. Uh, so clearly, it's not causing insulin resistance in me because that is the best metric for metabolic flexibility is a fasting insulin. It should be below three. It shouldn't have to be below what was 0 0.4 <laughs> or unmeasurable. Uh, and and I, don't, I think Quest doesn't even, they only go to below two, but LabCorp does have a lower threshold sensitivity and they go to i didn't know i actually beat that for the first time i, I never got down below 0.4 which is interesting so wow that, that, that's low <laughs> have you measured your fasting insulin uh you know what not for years i, I did years ago it was low too yeah yeah it was it was pretty low i um you know th th this is why I now it's been years i i use one of those uh, continuous blood glucose yeah, monitors. That, yeah yeah and, and that, that was so interesting you know because there were certain yeah. things that i thought i, I want to give you an example of this i i uh there were certain foods there were certain fruits <laughs> that really caused my 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 numbers to jump a little bit more but then for instance just give you an example potatoes my body acted like I could eat potatoes all day and it didn't seem to affect it. Yeah, yeah. Potatoes so, actually is a decent, if you, if you have a healthy gut, it's particularly good. Potatoes uh, and rice, you want to cook them though really well. You don't want to even yeah. raw, they're very toxic. So you have to cook them really well. Ideally, the best way to cook potatoes is boil them in a pressure cooker and they'll cook them pretty well. Or rice too, right, same thing. White rice, not brown yeah. rice. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, Dr. McCall. You know, when I when I when I first heard you lecture, there, we, we, you talked a lot about vitamin D, and you've promoted and talked about so many different nutrients over the years. Today, wh where you stand, what do you believe are the top nutritional deficiencies we, we currently have today? Well, vitamin D is one, but it's not a vitamin deficiency. It's a sun deficiency. It's a marker. It's a biomarker for sun exposure, essentially, and. Unless you're taking a supplement, then it's not. But, you know, the, the initial studies, the epidemiological studies that showed all the benefits of sun exposure and the, the massive impact it had on autoimmune diseases like auto, like MS would be a classic example, uh, really well documented. And they, you know, the, people weren't doing vitamin D testing or even taking supplements until I started that. I catalyzed that. I don't know if you know, remember that. I, 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 I believe it. It was me. I'm sure. I was, the one, I was the one who was heralded, shouting from the rooftops that vitamin D is a big issue because I believed in sun exposure and I've continued that belief. Uh, but you know, I, well, I, and I remember I, you getting I, I so much flack. I, 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 listen, I remember you getting so much flack from people saying there's this crazy doctor saying, you know, we, we should, we should get direct sunlight and exposure and not coat, you know, the toxic sunscreen on our skin. Mm -hmm. And I remember you getting a hard time for, it, but then the entire medical community adopted what you've been preaching for 10 years. So yes, absolutely. well, actually closer to two decades, because I, I started recommending it in early 2000s, 2024, that's almost a quarter century. Yeah. So, you know, I'm very grateful. It's one of my massive, biggest uh, to date clinical achievements is to help the community understand the importance of vitamin D. 
you know, because I got a big platform and people read it and they pass it around and it's hard yep. to stop information like that from going around. And it did. It, people start, and they regularly test it. But, and, and actually, uh, I'm in the process. You ever, you ever, I don't know if you read the mitochondrial research, but there's a assay called the seahorse assay. Have you ever I, read I, haven't, I haven't read that one. No, no I'd love to hear about it. Up. It's, it's the gold standard for measuring mitochondrial function or respiration. Mm. It's a complex series of assays, very difficult to do. The, the equipment is not very expensive, but the, it's, the, it's a very tedious assay. And, and they could, you couldn't freeze the sample, so it was very difficult. It would cost thousands of dollars to do one test. It's not available in any lab. It's a research tool only. So uh, I've actually am working with a company and acquired a patent from UCLA, or at least a license, rather, to advance that technology so that we can commercially assay that and prove some of my theories. Because it, it's, it's basically... A research tool that you can document a person's mitochondrial function. You can imp implement an intervention and do pre and post and see the differences in how the mitochondria are working and you know, really define it objectively, not just, oh, yeah, your mitochondria are better. Well, we can measure it. You can actually measure it. So that's pretty, pretty interesting. We're gonna, that's some of the research I'm doing later this year, writing papers on it. Uh, but getting back to the nutri other nutrient deficiencies, because I do seek to honor and to answer your questions, commit to that. Uh, Certainly vitamin D is one, but again, not to take a supplement. I haven't taken vitamin D in coming up on 20 years. Yeah, maybe 15, wow. 15, 16, but it's coming up on 20. At some point, some of it be 20 years. I, I just don't take vitamin D supplements. And my, throughout most of the summer last year, my vitamin D was in triple digits. Wow. Triple hey, what, what, what do you believe the normal range should be for vitamin well, D? Because I know your, your I, recommendations I think, are much higher than the, you know, Well, it's 60, 80 is the goal for most people. But if you're if you're getting it from the sun, there's no concern because you have intrinsic bio or feedback mechanisms which limit it. So you know you don't have to worry about it. If, you know, and, and lifeguards will tend to get readings closer to under. And there's a lot of cofactors to go with. And one of the cofactors, two primarily, one is K2, and the other is mangan a uh, mangan magnesium. So I, I take sufficient magnesium, and if you don't have those cofactors, sometimes you can expose the sun and it won't work. So that's a good thing to take. And most people are deficient in magnesium. That's that's probably one and two is vitamin D and magnesium, I would think. And the other one, as it's somewhat related to my previous thing, is is a food that most people don't. There's two two primary foods that people don't get enough of. Uh, there's starting to emerge some data now that suggests that taking supplements like glycine, which I'm sure I've heard of, uh, is really useful. And it's useful for a darn good reason, because it's one of the three primary amino acids in collagen. Uh, and uh, it's the smallest amino acid. And collagen is in connective tissue, like skin, hair, nails, tendons, ligaments. Uh, that's, that's what it's made of, even bones. There's a big significant po component of collagen in bones. It's, just, it's an extracellular matrix that supports your tissues. It keeps you standing and moving and you know, it gives your body structure, essentially. And if you don't get enough, you're not gonna, you cannot build healthy collagen if you just have meat. It won't work. There's yeah. not enough of those rate-limiting amino acids. There's three. Glycine is one, proline, and then hydroxyproline, which has a lot to do with what the research I'm working on. It's hydroxyproline. Forms a very magical function in the body that I will re reveal later this year. But uh, those are the three magic amino acids. And they, they are a repeating structure within collagen, and it actually forms a triple helix. And a uh, very special sauce, what happens with a triple helix. And, and I've kind of identified what that is. But essentially, if, you, if you're not eating connective tissue, and most of us don't, and most of us have stopped eating Jello as a dessert in the yeah. 50s and 60s. That does, I mean, you can still buy Jello, but now it's a perversion. It's not what it used to be, but which is just gelatin. And gelatin and collagen are almost identical. Gelatin is a little more processed. Uh, collagen is a little typically a bit healthier. And you can make collagen. The ideal way to get collagen is by making it. And that most people make it. It's. I started with, I, I, I'm sure you've heard of uh, Natasha McCampbell. McCampbell oh, yeah. Campbell mm -hmm. McBride. That's it. Cap Natasha Campbell McBride. Uh, she was, she's a neurologist, had an autistic child, and popular as a diet called the GAPS diet. And a big portion of the GAPS diet was bone broth. And I tried to make it back then. It was in the early 2000s. And it's such a pain. You got to cook the bones for 72 hours. Who's got time to cook bones for 72 hours? Yeah. Well, I, I, I learned and I figured out, others have figured it out too, but there's a much simpler, more efficient and quicker way to do it. You have any guess on how to do it? You might. You're pretty smart. 
A, a faster way to make bone broth? Yes. Well, you could do a pressure cooker. That's it. I knew you yeah. did. Yeah, pressure cooker. Yeah. Four hours. If you have organic grass-fed bones, and the best are beef, beef is the best, I would be careful of chicken bones because the fat in chickens, unless you're raising chickens based on a protocol developed by Ashley Armstrong, and, and it's being spread across the country, and I'm helping her with that, and, and ap- actually having a brand of eggs called Golden Nuggets because they are one-fourth to one-fifth, maybe even one-sixth less linoleic acid than a normal egg. Mm. In other words, you can eat six of her eggs and you have as much linoleic acid as in, as in one of the a commercial egg. That much lower reduction. And wow. it doesn't matter if the LA is from a healthy food like eggs, it, it's still dangerous. And, and when quantities exceed a certain threshold, it was just typically about two grams a day, certainly more than five grams a day. And almost everyone now is getting 10, 15, 20 grams a day. So yeah. once, you, once you get over four or five grams, you reach a threshold where you're increasing your risk for almost every disease, especially cancer. I think that's cancer and estrogen or estrogen and um, linoleic acid and endotoxin are the three, three primary causes of cancer because they all mm. destroy metabolic function and they cause this. When your mitochondria don't work, you have to resort to a primitive form to create energy, anaerobic f- fermentation. So that's creation of cellular energy, not in the mitochondria, but in the cytosol, in the cytoplasm, in a, in a primitive pathway called glycolysis. And that's not efficient at all. And generates lactic acid and causes lots of problems. And you, and that's what happens when you're metabolically inflexible. You go towards that pathway, and that's a cancer pathway. Bad news. Bad news. Hey, Dr. Ox here. Do you have limiting beliefs that are holding you back from a serious breakthrough in your life? If so, you're not alone. As a doctor, I've witnessed countless patients who no matter how many new diets or lifestyle hacks they tried, would continue to get stuck in the same rut, unable to achieve long lasting transformation until they changed their mindsets. As soon as they began to think this, not that, the results were incredible. A mindset controlled by limiting beliefs will keep you stuck, locked in a prison of unpursued dreams and unreached goals. While life may be bearable on this level, it's also stale and unfulfilling. The good news is it doesn't have to stay this way. In Think This, Not That, I uncover 12 mental barriers that obstruct personal growth and hinder success and give you the tools to break through these barriers to help you live your best life possible. Each chapter explores one of these barriers with helpful visuals and practical exercises you can use to peel back the layers of the false narratives that have held you captive and finally experience a transformative mind shift. You can order a copy at joshax.com, and if you order before April 2nd, you'll get an exclusive to my three-part Mindset Masterclass, also a 12-week workbook, also numerous other bonuses that are worth hundreds of dollars to help you think this, not that, and experience that breakthrough you've been waiting for. Yeah, so, it's, it's, it's so, well, it's so interesting what you're sh- saying. You know, I, there, there is a company that I work with, they do blood work. Mm-hmm. And they had told me, and they test, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And they said when they were looking at the deficiencies, the most common ones, the top three micronutrients were vitamin D, magnesium, and I want to say the third was zinc. Those it were their. Be. It could be, yeah, for yeah, sure. Those were, the, those were the. So you're yeah. spot on with what you're sharing. And then again, collagen, we know. And you know what's so interesting? Well, there's one and, and more I, I want to mention. Yeah. It's in yeah. eggs, but healthy eggs only. And we actually, we're going to make a, a form of this that doesn't exist because there is no healthy supplement for this, this nutrient. So do not take this supplement as a nutrient. You have to take it as food. And the only food that's high in is eggs. Egg yolk, not the whites. I do not recommend eating egg whites. I do not eat egg whites. Uh, I only eat egg yolks. The whites are, are loaded with tryptophan, which is a precursor of serotonin. Serotonin is not your friend in high levels. You do not want excess serotonin. Mm. So, um, uh, the, the nutrient I was referring to is choline. Almost mm. everyone's deficient in choline, choline and collagen. And uh, unless you're eating egg yolks, you're not going to get it. I mean, it's, you're almost, you need like four or 500 milligrams a day. And egg yolk, even one egg yolk only is 125. But that's the highest form of, of co- source of choline. I mean, you can get it in liver, but the amount of the liver need, would, would you get, you'd get toxic in some of the, the, oil, so, the, the fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A. So the best source is egg yolks. And that's why I think almost everyone would benefit from healthy eggs. But 
<laughs> if you got the LA, it's like you're putting a rock in a hard place, you know, you, but you can't, I personally raise my own chickens. I have 25 chickens. Wow. And I have a guard dog to protect against a predator. So, <laughs> yeah, but because I've, I've had like over 50, 60 chickens killed by predators. That is a problem. Uh, Cause they're so hard. They're so, they have no defenses. They're just like yeah. dessert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's good dessert for the by predators because they're very low a L A. They just I don't give them hardly any L. It's like it's uh, like it's very similar to Ashley's eggs because I use her her formula to feed them. Uh, so that's good. Uh, so we were talking about nutrients and I forgot where I left off. It was uh, zinc you mentioned and well yeah and you were talking about choline and the incredible benefits there. Yeah. Yeah, choline is a precursor for acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter for the parasympathetic nervous system. Most of us, don't, it doesn't function well. So, yeah, and it has a, a wide variety of other functions. Uh, but it, 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 your health is not is going to be challenged if you're not. It actually is a, I think, forms a phospholipid too, which is important for structural function and, and other metabolic or, or biochemical characteristics, or not characteristics, but functions that we have. So choline is, you, you want to be really careful. And there's nutrient trackers like chronometer that you can use to input that are free and you just input your food and it'll tell you how much you're getting. So you don't have to guess. You can, for, you can look at these foods and you can look at your, your protein constituents too. So, you know, although chronometer doesn't do well for measuring, they'd only put the essential aminos and glycine is not considered an essential amino acid, but it should be. It's kind of a misnomer really because is by their definition what they can say. Yes, it's essential if your body can make it, but if you can't make it in sufficient quantities for you're required for health, then it becomes essential, which what happens with glycine. Even though your body makes glycine, it can't make enough because your requirement is so high that you have to, you have to get it in your diet. Otherwise, you're not going to be healthy. You, you, it, you cannot make enough glycine to be healthy. It's impossible. You, you, you know, one of the things that myself and Jordan Rubin, we've, we've talked about this a few times when we started really getting into bone broth and using it and looking at how much of our body's made up of these collagen, collagen. proteins. It's like one uh, third. Know, one third. Yeah. Uh, one third of the proteins yeah. are collagen. That is a, a mind bending fact. And congratulations to you for, for knowing that because most but, people don't. But, but here's one my third. question for you. I want to get your thoughts on this is that, you know, I remember when Dr. Sears came out with this and you were sharing this around the same time. You were the first two people I heard say this in terms of these omega ratios, right? We need mm -hmm. more omega threes are the omega sixes. Mm -hmm are mm -hmm. way too high that's causing inflammation. Yes. Do, do you think there's a similar phenomenon, a similar aspect to balancing out your collagen proteins and more of these? No question, absolutely. Proteins? Yes, and that's well documented. You can just look up the literature, the, the excess of certain amino acids in meat, like methionine, methionine. Methane, serotonin, yeah. or tryptophan. And, and, and then I read another study that said with decreases in longevity. But yeah, if you I, balance I it out another, with collagen, then it's okay. Yeah, yeah, because I read another study. So it was like methionine D de could decrease your lifespan, but glycine could increase, increase your lifespan. The glycine to methionine ratio, right? But there's also histidine and there's tryptophan. So these are things that you do not want. You need some. Yes, you absolutely need some. But you, when you go excess and you eat just an all meat diet, it's like carnivore, not a good idea unless you're eating the connective tissue. Some people do. They eat the bone broth. And that's the easiest way to get it. It's the bone broth. And make it in a, in a, a oh, this is a pearl for you because you probably don't know this. But if yeah. you have a pet, you should. It, uh, you can go to butcher, preferably a butcher from a grass-fed organic yep. cow, and get what's called the knuckle bone. Have you ever heard of the knuckle bone? Probably haven't. Mm -hmm. It's not a knuckle. It's actually a butcher term for the hip bone or the mm -hmm. knee bone. It's a, it's a joint. And, and they're... They're about the size. You can hold it with two hands. It's not huge. It probably weighs, I don't know, two to four pounds, depending on the size of the animal. And you could take one of those bones and put it in a pressure cooker, fill it up the water up to uh, above the bone, and then turn it on for four hours if it's an organic grass-fed cow. If it's not organic, then you only do it for two hours because you're going to leach out some crap out of the bones that you don't want. So you can, you can the four hours is better, but, you know, only if it's a healthy animal. And then you... Uh, let it cool down. And then here's the key that's sometimes forgotten is that once it's cooled down, you put it in the refrigerator overnight or in the freezer, if you're going to do it in an hour or two, and then you skim off the fat, skim off the fat. You don't want to keep the fat in there. And then you've got bone broth. That's like mm. some of the best bone broth you can get. And you can't great. buy bone broth that good, fresh and made from healthy bones. I mean, that's the perfect bone, bone broth. And, and that bone, if you want to give, if you want to have healthy pets, that's another passion of mine is, because 
virtually every, pretty much every pet food that's sold is going to decrease your, your pet's lifespan by almost yeah. 50%, 50%. It's just, it's worse than human nutrition. And they, they've bastardized the rules to, to prevent any other company from competing and, and prevent them literally makes it illegal to put good foods in there. Like, like animal fats. Yeah. You know, so you have to make your own and it's pretty easy to do. You, you can just give them the, the diet for cats or for bones or for dogs is bones, r- raw bones, not cooked bones, raw bones, uh, and meat. <laughs> Yeah, bones yeah. are full of connective tissue, so they don't have to worry about eating the meat, but they'll eat the fat too, and they get the connective. So they got the perfect balance. That's eat, literally, and then of course the organs, you know, or uh, liver and heart, but not large amounts, maybe an ounce or two a day, depending on the size of the dog, and um, and that is the perfect. They're they're literally eating nose to tail. They're eating all the connective tissue. They're eating the mi- muscle meat, and they're eating the organs. And that is a prescription for health and the bones. And, and if you don't give your dog bones, they will have dental decay and, and they'll, they have, might be have, to, have their teeth pulled because mm. they're, they're rotting because the bones are what's required to clean the dental plaque from, from the, their teeth. Mm. And when you give them bones, like every day, they will have the cleanest teeth and, and they'll never have dental disease. Yeah. It's amazing. And, you know, so that's that's what they need. And, you know, so I know it's not a human tantrum, but a lot of people have pets. I want, I want to ask you one more question about pets. When you think about pets and you think about obviously the food, feeding them raw, as you talked about real food, what are some of the other things? If there is one supplement that a dog would need, that dogs tend to be deficient in, what are, what are the top one or two that, that oh, you I'll think? The top one, the only one I give my dog. Yeah. Eggshells. Crushed eggshells, a half a teaspoon. Really? Why? Calcium. What, what, yeah. Calcium. And calcium, If you, the, the, we're actually going to make a product out of this. Uh, but crushed eggshells from healthy chickens uh, actually have collagen in the, 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 and hyaluronic the acid. Me- the, the membrane, membrane. inside. Yes. Yeah. So, but you can dry them and crush them up in a, in a uh, coffee grinder or a bigger mixer if you have more. And you and you and you have the best calcium supplement out there. And you mm. just put it in their food; they'll eat it. It's and it does always really. It's calcium carbonate primarily, and highly absorbable. And guess what else it is? It's a trace mineral supplement. Mm. Go figure. Yeah. And guess the only problem is it costs too much. Yeah. It's free. Wow, it's free exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that would be the supplement I give them. And yeah, I, technically it's not a supplement; it's a food. Isn't there? Is they're eating the eggshells? Uh, and I don't do not feed my pet. The, the whites at all i just give them the oaks uh yeah because they need they just like we do they need the choline so i i probably uh I, my chickens i had some problems with them so they're not i'm only giving them two a day but i'm going to give them six a day pretty soon six yolks wow yeah. amazing but he's a big dog he's going to be 150 pounds so you, you know one of the other things that, that i've been I've admired so much about you for so long, uh, Dr. McCullough, is that you, you've always been very outspoken. You know, the, whether it was the COVID pandemic or the pharmaceutical companies using Roundup years ago or the overprescription of medications, you've always been the mm-hmm. first person I can think of to speak out against these people with really no fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts. I want to I want to go to Roundup and some of these chemical, the insecticides, mm-hmm. the pesticides. What are some things people need to be aware of when it comes to these chemicals? What are some of the side effects and what are some of the things people can do in terms of just consciously avoiding them? Okay, that's a good question. But I can acknowledge, thank you for the comment on the fear. I happen to be allergic to fear. (laughs) I'm allergic to fear. And that's because fear is a thought that resides in your mind. Mm. And we run into serious problems if we're in our mind all the time because that's a, a thimble of knowledge compared to the ocean of infinite wisdom that's available outside of that. And when you access that, there is no fear there, none, zero. When you connect to your consciousness or some people call it spirit or energy, it's just not there. There is no fear. So it's easy to do these things if you're in that space. And I mm. tend to spend a lot of time there. So that's what I enjoy doing. Yeah. So the with respect to the Roundup, uh, it's interesting. Glyphosate, you, it sounds familiar. Gly. Glycine. Well, glyphosate is glycine with phosphates on it. That's all it is. So there are some scientists like Stephanie Seneff who speculate that it is a substitution into the amino acid because you know it's there, it's present, and 
gets plugged in to uh, the DNA sequence or the RNA that is the instructions to make the proteins, right? The transcription of the proteins. And uh, that could be a problem. I mean, some, some others suggest that steric hindrance or the just the physical characteristics of the size of the molecule may be a problem, but it, it clearly it's a it's a metabolic poison. It, it's it it's uh, it should not be in your body. And, and, you, and the, fortunately, there's very simple and easy ways to avoid it. One is you know it certainly would be make sure you get enough connected tissue would be ideally or take glycine. If the, the hep hypothesis is correct, then you know you'll have a, have a sufficiency of glycine will prevent it being integrated that the glyphosate molecule being integrated into your proteins. Secondly, is to just avoid GMOs. I know sometimes that's hard, uh, especially with with grains, because many grains, like wheat, would be the classic example. It's not a GMO grain, but they use it to dry the wheat, and they don't even have to put it on the label. They, so when they cut it down and harvest it, the easiest way for them to do is spray glyphosate on it. Wow, that's you know. So unless it's organic wheat, it's going to have be most likely have glyphosate. So oh. it's pervasive. Um, you know, if you're healthy, you get sun exposure and you do sauna. Sauna would be another way to help detox it out of your body. I do a sauna three days, three days a week. I've been doing right before this interview. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a good practice to get into. If you run, I don't, I used to be a runner. Uh, and uh, during those days, I didn't need to take a sauna because really the reason sauna works is it causes sweat. And when you, and you sweat, you excrete the toxins. So if you're sweating regularly, you don't need a sauna, but most of us don't. And since I stopped running, gosh, it's almost a quarter century ago, uh, I need a sauna. And I think most people, unless they're doing cardio or they're sweating all day, they need to do a sauna. Benefit from yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So so what is, one, one thing that, again, I've, I've noticed that you've done over the years is you've been very advanced in terms of some of the tech and doing some different everything from you were one of the first people to talk about infrared saunas mm -hmm. and um you know using things like this for our health hyperbaric chambers you you know you you had talked about yeah, I, I, know, many I, years I, ago I, you know, i've explored some things that i later find out may not be as good as i thought hyperbaric chambers were one of them i mean they're you they have the utility for sure they helped a lot of people but it's not a great innovation as i initially believed uh so there are other simpler ones, you know, one of the best, you know, what do you think the best, what, I've been exercising since 1968, Josh, that's a long time. That's 56 years. That's a long, that's a half a century, more than half a century. So what do you think I've concluded is the best exercise? I'm going to guess weight training. No, you guess incorrectly. Huh. It's not, it's a useful exercise and it's something I do engage in. But interestingly, there was a study published in July of last year out of the oh, University I, of Minnesota. Yeah. Walking. That, yeah, walking. It's walking. Yeah. And walking because it's a moderate exercise. We're, we're exercising. We're, resistance training is pretty pernicious, actually. You, it's it's actually toxic. And you can see that by the people who bodybuild. You know, they tend to die early. A lot of a lot of them. There's, yeah. These are not people who live in the bicentenarians, typically. So does that mean you shouldn't do it? No, you just have to do it wisely. And wisely is like less than two hours a week. And I, I was, there were days I was actually working out two, two hours a day. You know, I got to be pretty buff too. I mean, especially for someone at 70. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've, it does, definitely does work. And there's value. You don't want to be sarcopenic and you get older. But on the other hand, you don't want to stress your body that much. And walking doesn't. The, the study that was published last year showed pretty clearly. I actually interviewed the author of the study. He was, a, he was a male clinic fellow, I think. And he found that there was this, there was no J curve for, for walking. In other words, the more you walk, the better benefit you got. It was actually like a 40% decrease in mortality with just walking, wow. just walking, but you got to do it. You, you know, and the new beautiful thing about walking, it doesn't have to be all at once. In fact, it's probably better if you, if you break it up, the more you break it up, the better. So you can do a two hour walk and you can do just say an hour walk or you can do four 15 minutes walks, you know, the four 15 minutes would be better, a hundred percent better because your body likes to break it up during the day. You, know, you don't want to be static you know, all day. So walking would be the best for sure. Resistance training is good. Flexibility training. I'm actually developing a few things, developing something called 22nd century medicine. And a subdivision is that 22nd century yoga, which is a mobility movement. Actually, mobility medicine is what I'm calling it. And I released some of my first chapters in the, in, in the, on the site next week. You would know that you're a chiropractor. How many, what percentage of the population has... Adult population has cervical problems, neck neck issues. 
Take a guess. I mean, at what age? Just the general no, adults, population. Adults, adults, not not kids. Seventy percent. Close. You're pretty, you're pretty sharp, Josh. No, eighty percent. Yeah, that's a yeah. lot. That's a lot. That is a lot. No, you don't see patients now, but when you were, you saw a lot of neck problems. Yeah. So there, there are simple things you can do, sunlight being one of them, and exercises, but mobility movements, because typically yoga doesn't address the neck. They don't. I mean, some maybe there's some de yeah, derivatives right, yeah. of yoga that do, but they typically don't dress the neck. And that's 80% of the problem. You know? Yeah. Cervical degenerative disease is real and pervasive. So, you know, I've, I've developed, it's actually an article I'm publishing I think it's next week. Yeah, I think it is next week. Yeah, and, and I integrate things like active isolated stretching and I, something I innovated, I call it the circle eight, or it's, it's an infinity symbol and moving your mech, neck in, a, mm -hmm. in a, an infinity symbol, doing that in conjunction with near infrared light on your cervical spine. So, you know, that's this is 22nd century yoga I created. Yeah, wow. So, yeah, because you, the goal, the goal, so what what are the metrics of health, right? How do you know you're reversing biological age? It's, a, it's an interesting question because I can assure mm -hmm. you that DNA methylation is not the answer. It's confusion. And it gives you false information. But it's pretty simple. What are the biological functions of humans? And you age parameter that. So wouldn't it be, would you consider yourself less biologically old if you had the mobility of a child? Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't you? I mean, that's pretty, or if you could see as well as a child, or if you could hear or if you could taste, or you can smell as well. So it's your biology that gives you the clues and you can measure these things. Mm. So those are the metrics that need to be done to determine biological age. And then mitochondrial oh. function too, would be another more, even more fundamental one. So the metrics that, that longevity medicine has are bullshit, essentially. They, they're almost meaningless, almost meaningless. Yeah. yeah. And uh, another metric is grip strength. Do you ever measure your grip strength? No, you know what though? I, I'd read that. The only way I've done that is through. Um, I, I I read I read a study on this a couple of years ago, and so one of the things I started doing was just hanging from a pull up bar. So I get up to you, about you, two you, minutes. You nailed this. That's a that's, that's definitely part of mobility medicine for sure. How long are you hanging for? I'm about I'm up to like two minutes. Wow! Congratulations. Yeah. That's an A plus. Yeah. The the only reason I now my so let me tell you I had a great dad growing up. My dad. Uh, he was an old military guy. He was a great guy. But he, he's before still, I still alive? So yeah, he, he's in his seventies. They live in wow, Florida. Okay. They, they're yeah, great Excellent. people. But Excellent. before I walked in from the garage, he put in a pull up bar and he said, "I want you to do pull ups every every day before you walk in the door." So I mean, I was able to at one point do almost thirty pull ups. So I actually well, had a little time? bit of an advantage. Yeah. Now this was when I was wow, that eighteen is years impressive. old. That was okay. impressive. I can't, Nevertheless. I can't, that I can't Anything do that over anymore. 20 is like world class almost, you know, it's really hard to get over 20 because it, it, it's you, it, you, you lose the, the energy to do it. It's, you, I mean, you obviously yeah. have muscles, you need muscles to do it, but you just don't have enough, you can't create enough energy to do it. That's, that's a fantastic. Now, how many yeah. people, there's very few people who could have ever done 30 pull-ups at once. Very few. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's my, that's my, the, the one thing I can, you know, probably the one physical all sort right, of area you, I, I could, I, I could, I could have bragged about, but yeah, that, that's all yeah. thanks to my dad for sure. Well, thank you. Yeah. Your dad, our parents are, you know, the parent, if it's very rare to have two parents that love you, but if you do, is you very well, oh, your dad obviously did. Both. And, yeah. And if your mom did too. Then you're set. There's only one person out of 50 who has that privilege. Only one. I, I happen to have it too. So my both of my parents love me tremendously through the roof, and uh, that allows you to function in the culture to do things that are extraordinary. Now you can get that benefit by yourself, but it's really hard. It's really hard, and that's a, that's a big portion of what I'm doing with the book that I've written is helping people understand that and, and, and implement strategies to get connect back to their consciousness and spirit. So because that's a big thing, you know, and, and one of the ways is to be biologically healthy for sure you know, improve mitochondrial cellular energy production because the, cell, the, the energy we produce in our mitochondria is almost ident identical to the energy we came from. Mm. It's a mind-bending wow. concept, but it's true. And the energy that we ultimately return to is really, it's almost identical. So, and we create that in our bodies when we're alive. And then when we pass, you know, we return to energy. So, but it's interesting. It's, it's a similar type of energy, almost identical. Wow. So, so and, and one of the ways, you know, so by 
engaging in production, not only do you improve your biological health, but you improve your spiritual health and your ability to connect to your consciousness and, and you have access to resources and wisdom that is not available in your mind, just isn't. Because your mind is usually polluted with brainwashing propaganda. Typically. Yeah. Typically yeah. in our culture. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. You know, what? one of the things, one of the last things oh, I'll wait, just say, wait, and then no, no, wait, wait, let, let me just ahead. mention this because I want to mention yeah. it before you go, is that I would go to Amazon and look up a dynamometer. They cost about $25 and you can measure your grip strength. I'll bet you you're yeah. close to, to 60 kilograms, which is about maybe 130 pounds. If you can tank for two minutes, you're about 130 pounds. I can, I can, mine, I'm about 125, 128 uh, pounds or 50, I think it was almost 60. I was like 58.8 kilograms. But they're tw yeah, 25 bucks. It's all, you know, because you think, oh, this is like $400 instrument and I, I don't know how to interpret it. But it's, a, it's a digital instrument. You turn it on and you go, you just press it and then you'll know your grip strength. But grip strength, it is clearly associated with, it's probably one of the most powerful ones associated with longevity, very accurate. And, and because you cannot do this, you cannot, you have to have strong muscles, but you have to be able to create cellular energy to do that. Mm. So congratulations. Two minutes is phenomenal. Most people, they, they will have trouble getting to 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I was reading. Um, yeah. Especially what, over 60. Yeah. The, the number is extremely low. It really starts to. Yeah. I can get to two minutes pretty regularly, but That's it's, awesome. it's not easy. It's not easy. It's, it's definitely a feat. You know, there's not many seven year olds wow. that can do that. Oh, I mean, yeah. There's, there's some, but I've actually done three minutes if I cheat. And by cheating, you can put liquid sticky stuff on it and you're, you're, yeah. just, you're just like glued to the yeah <laughs> they're glued to the bar that's funny that's which, so which good like, well i'm yeah. i i am i'm incredibly impressed you know one, one of the last things i want to just share is is that you know you've done such an amazing job in, in something you would re you had referenced earlier and that is and i want to give a quote of this and you've heard this before but you know john d rockefeller said i don't want a nation nation of thinkers i want a nation of workers Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I think that uh, more and more people, I do feel like going through this COVID pandemic, there were a lot of people that were asleep and n n most haven't woken up, but a lot more have. Mm -hmm. I think a lot more people are aware now because they just f tried to force things on us. It's such a strong way. And I think that most people don't think like, I think uh, Carl Jung, the famed psychologist said, most people don't think you know, it's hard. That's why most people don't do it. But one of the things that you've really inspired so many people to do is be able to think. And you were one of the first people I remember who said, well, you, you asked that, you know, a way to get to the truth is to ask why again and again and again and again to where you get to the root. And so you've done such a phenomenal job of just being able to do that with people. And so one of the last questions I have for you is, how have you or how do you recommend people that listen to this? How do you recommend that they learn to think? How do, how, how do you recommend they learn to start to get to the root of the issues like you have done? Because again, you've really been able to do this to get to the root of the problems really earlier than so many people. Well, I think it's, the, 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 there's a, it's a great question and it's not a simple answer, but it's, it just goes back to the basics. And the ones I mentioned earlier in our conversation is that you have to have uh, cellular energy production. If you don't have energy, you, your brain is not functioning. You can't think. You, you, mm. you really need power yeah. and energy, and you get it from food, avoiding linoleic acid, which is a mitochondrial poison. Keep your intake below two grams a day. There's a there's a uh, uh, an important video I created, and actually, I, I, I could announce here, but uh, on yeah this Sunday, all our articles come back. From behind the paywall and Substack, so that is available for anyone to wonderful. To look. Yeah, so we're making we decided to do that uh, and bring them back. But you can look at that video for the details because the devil's in the details. So get low linoleic acid and get connect to you know that helps to connect your consciousness because you can, if you're in your mind and you're listening to brainwashing propaganda and you're watching TV, the news, which is one of the worst things you can do that will perpetuate fear. If you're on social media, so you want to disengage from that completely and identify sources that are telling the truth, at least as far as you can perceive, because sometimes it's really difficult, but at least you'll, the information you're consuming is not obvious propaganda because almost anything from the conventional media, New York times, yeah. Washington post, CNN, MSNBC, that, that's all just government propaganda, nothing pure, but pure propaganda. And, and it's, it may be true, but, but probably is more likely than not true. 
this is definitely pushing an agenda. So if you get that data input minimized and you are healthy, then you'll be able to connect better to your consciousness and really activate that because you could have the best brain out there, but if you are metabolically damaged and it does, you don't have the energy to think it's it, it, you, that's the first step. You have to have fuel in the tank. You have mm. to feel and take. And then, X, you know, get, what are the other things? Walking every day. Yes. You know, sleeping well. This is not rocket science at all. There are some really powerful innovations that you can do that are thanks to technology, but you got to have the basics first walking, sun exposure, no linoleic acid, you know, no processed foods, essentially, which, are, you know, replicating ancestral practices. And when you do that, stay away from the brainwashing propaganda and connect to valid sources of truth and wisdom, you know, you're golden and, and you'll self-correct and you'll, you'll think because you'll be, you'll be inputting data that's closer to truth than listening to, to the lies essentially. So good. Well, Dr. Mm-hmm. McCullough, I want to say thanks so much for coming on and share your wisdom. Thank you so much. I mean, there are so many people that I think most people recognize this for anyone that's followed you, but you've inspired so many people in the space to start to take control of their health. Yeah. To start to- you, know many, you know how many that is? We had it measured. It's hundreds of millions. Wow. Hundreds of Amazing. millions. But you know what? That seems like a lot, and it is. But you know, it's we're not finished because yeah. the goal is four billion. Wow. And I'm pretty confident we're going to reach it in the next five years. We've That's got amazing. we've got a strategy. So it, it you're you're gonna see a lot of what I'm doing in the next few months. It's this all the book's all about it, and we've got really big plans. So I'm so excited because this is what you heard in this conversation is exactly what people need to hear. And ha- and what I'm seeking to implement is strategy so that they can integrate that into their lifestyle easily and facilitate it with simple strategies. So, cause it, the body's the magic, you know, you were taught that in chiropractic, it's innate intelligence, right? All yeah. you have to do is activate it. That's all it requires. It's not like rocket science. You just give the body what it needs. It will take care of it. It, it does not want to go to disease. It wants to go to health. Yeah. That's what you're designed to do. It, you know, if given what you, what you need, you're going to be healthy. That's it. It's, it's your advantage. You just have to stay away from stuff that's going to make you unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. Well, we want to thank everybody for listening today. I want to thank, again, Dr. Mercola here for sharing all his wisdom today. And be on the lookout for his new book. It'll be coming out here before too long. So you can go to Amazon or just search for it on his website. It's Mercola.com. But mm-hmm. check out his new book. Check out his articles. He's such a wealth of knowledge and wisdom. And want to say again, thanks so much for just being a pioneer and a trailblazer. In the uh, in, in just natural health, you've inspired so many people, Doctor Mercola. Yeah, well, thank you. Th- thanks for the opportunity to have a delightful conversation. Appreciate it. Of course. And again, thanks everybody for listening and supporting uh, this show, the show, the Ancient Health uh, Podcast. Here, if you're not subscribed, make sure to subscribe. And uh, hey, if you enjoyed this, make sure to share it with a friend. Some of the wisdom Doctor Mercola shared today, I truly believe, is life changing. Everybody, again, thanks so much for uh, for watching. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode. 